Kevin, thank you for joining us. Sure. We appreciate it. Yep. Um, thanks for driving out. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> We've been told to keep the mics close. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and, and tell us what company you're with. Sure. Uh, my name is Kevin Zapula. I have been in the local space for a, a long time. Uh, before it was digital, it was Yellow Pages. Uh, now I'm COO of an agency called Ferocious Media. Um, and prior to that, I had started uh, early on in 2006, one of the first digital marketing companies um, catered to local called Driven Local. Um, our competitors at the time were... Uh, your reach locals, Yodel was around, um, Web Visible, they, they've come and gone, uh, Orange Soda, some of these early names that were, you know, doing basic PPC for uh, small businesses. Um, you know, to me, it was pretty attractive because it was, like I said, my background was Yellow Pages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was where consumers would look for advertisers. And it wasn't sexy, it wasn't uh, billboards, it wasn't commercials, but for small businesses, it was their lifeblood. You know, mm -hmm. it was a necessary evil to a lot of them. Um, I could tell I was only in the Yellow Pages for probably 10 years from a 100-year history they had, but I can tell uh, they ran like a, a little bit of a bureaucracy and a monopoly. Uh, mm -hmm. For a while, every county and city only had one Yellow Pages, and they would charge rates that were pretty exorbitant. Uh, I think, ironically, at the end of the day, as attractive as digital marketing is for a lot of these local businesses, they may be paying more now uh, for all of the things that they need to do to get their online presence proper mm -hmm. than just placing a quarter page ad in the yellow pages, which, you know, at the time was probably $1,000 a month to hit uh, Metro. Uh, but it's been an interesting swing. But what um, was exciting to me uh, was at the yellow pages, we were doing a pilot uh, to for search engine marketing, what it is now with call tracking, mm -hmm. uh, which to me, when I first saw one of our local advertisers show up on Google for a search, I think it was like Locksmith, New York City, uh, and we were able to track how many phone calls he got. You know, of course, you couldn't tell at the time what keyword it was or have any of the metrics we do today. It wasn't that sophisticated, but to me, it was really exciting. Um, and I worked on that pilot with Yellow Book for a while. We ended up acquiring a company in Coral Gable, Gables, Florida, uh, called Click Forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were looking at Reach Local and another company which was uh, acquired before we can actually do anything. Uh, but we ended up acquiring this company in uh, Coral Gables and offering, rolling out a PPC uh, solution to all of Yellow Book's customers across the country. So I spent a few years just traveling the country, uh, teaching uh, search engine marketing, sales, and how it works to lo the local sales forces. And, you know, I think um, I ended up making a lot of good contacts, uh, learning best practices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there were some mistakes that, you know, the Yellow Pages made back then. And, you know, like just a simple one, they didn't have a billing system set up to take a, an account increase. Mm -hmm. You know, so if someone signed up for $500 a month in search engine marketing and it was working and they call up and they say, I want to I want to do more of this. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, it's June. Uh, we can change your budget in February because that's mm -hmm. just how their billing systems were. They were an annual uh, billing cycle. Right. Uh, they wanted to have like the same keyword sets for locksmiths, um, any locksmith, you know, regardless of what was important to them. You know, so the way it was early on back then, I think a lot of these locksmiths, uh, as an example, and that's just one example, would end up with a ton of clicks for, you know, maybe key duplication or something that they really don't make money on mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, uh, some of the more sophisticated agencies were asking them, like, what's the important things? Like, what's your bread and butter? If, if the phone were to call uh, ring 10 times, who would you hope were on there? And, you know, none of those guys would say, you know, copy a key. Uh, it's, those were those were low cost keywords. That's that's why, you know, I think the yellow page systems or the way they were doing it with, you know, trying to get the lowest cost clicks, uh, that's what was happening versus saying, you know, what do you really want to do? And a lot of them want to do like CTV or, or CT closed caption TV type setups or commercial type uh, jobs. Right. Um, you know, major things. And, you know, um, in 2006, uh, I had a good friend that was in sales at a, at a company that he didn't need to spend a lot of time in his full time job. And I had mentioned this uh, 
you know, running ads on Google is just, you know, it's kryptonite. It's great. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's phenomenal. And he's one of those guys that doesn't need to have the sun line up with the stars and the moon to start a company. He's like, I'm going to see uh, a junk guy in, in uh, I think it was Staten Island or, or Queens. Uh, do we have paperwork or something to sign him up for that thing you said? <laughs> you know, so I, I, uh, I spent uh, probably overnight creating a contract on PowerPoint. And he went out, he made the sale, and, you know, from there, f had to figure out how to set up a merchant account to, to you know, run $500 uh, a month for, for this, uh, I think, junk removal guy was our first client. It might have been a carpet, uh, maybe a carpet dealer, but it was uh, a service-based business. And uh, from there, uh, you know, set the account up. And, you know, we, we went that way sort of part-time for a couple of years, but the renewal rate might have been... It might have been 100% uh, mm -hmm. like back then. And, the, you know, the competition wasn't as steep. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had a dentist in, in the Bronx that, you know, for $1,000, I want to say it was getting 300 calls a month. Like, mm -hmm. those were the numbers back then. Like, it, it didn't matter how, you know, really precise you were with your tracking and your landing pages and things. If you, if you were one of the early guys showing up on Google for all of the people that were using Google as a search engine, you were doing phenomenal. Um, so then I guess... Um, Around 2009, I said, we should really add some more salespeople. You know, we should find some guys. And we knew some good salespeople from the Yellow Pages and uh, brought them on board. Some were good. Some were not so good. You know, I think um, there are people that are better with technology. Sure. And there Understand are others that, that couldn't uh, pivot. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, we had early on signed a um, tent rental company on Long Island. Uh, I won't mention the name, but same thing for a thousand dollars. He might've been getting 800 calls a month, but like a typical small business, like didn't answer their phones. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and you can hear that through the call recording. Sure. So, you know, I almost jokingly around said to one of the sales guys we, we hired who wasn't the most technically savvy, we should start a tent rental business. All you got to do is answer these calls. Mm -hmm. So, um, we we actually did you know we ponied up we i don't know how much it cost maybe ninety thousand dollars between four of us for some trucks might have been 20 tents and 500 chairs but long story short it's a tough business yep. it, you know i thought it would just be like here's the investment you know get out of here mm -hmm. uh, there were some crazy stories of uh setting up tents uh friday nights at like three o'clock in the morning in people's yards with the lights out because we were just running so late or uh, it's a tough learning curve, um, but what really, really um, solidified how important and how well it works was that year we might have spent fourteen, maybe fifteen thousand dollars in in Google Ads mm -hmm. only. Brand new company, we did over five hundred thousand dollars in sales. The tent company. The tent company. Wow. Yep. Um, and this was two thousand nine. This was probably two thousand nine and ten. Yeah. Wow. Mm hmm. So long story short on that one, um, he ended up leaving Driven Local and we ended up selling him uh, full shares of that company, which he still Is runs. still open? And they're doing phenomenal. Wow. Phenomenal. Cool. Yep. Well, so, I mean, you, you talked about a lot there. Um, so many things that I have questions about. The first one is you kind of talked about Google ads yep. as your main thing at Driven Local. Yep. What about SEO? Um, what was the SEO culture like then and how has that changed? SEO wasn't really on my radar uh, that early on. It, it was purely Google Ads, and I think it was because of uh, you know our Yellow Pages background, mm -hmm. um, which is you can put an investment in and get an investment out, but it was definitely more quantifiable because we were tracking all of the phone calls. Um, you know, it's not like today where we can say you got 50 phone calls to turn into five thousand dollars in sales. It was you got 50 phone calls. I hope you did well with them. Like. That was that was cool. That was good. It was you know it was inevitably working for these small business owners. Sure. And it wasn't as cutthroat. Like I said, there was a lot more um, leeway. So you didn't have to be as precise. You didn't need to have all the connections you needed to. You you really should have today. Um, so we were focused on on Google Ads. And um, I also want to say probably in two thousand and nine or ten, it was early on uh, on the Google Partners. Um, side so they when they first launched google ads they went to a lot of the big sales forces out there they weren't a big company uh, themselves i think they might have been fifteen thousand employees total mm -hmm. 
And they would go to, you know, yellowpages.com or the big yellow page companies, the radio companies, um, anybody with a big sales force and say, hey, you want to be a Google partner? Um, you know, we want to work with you. And they would. And, and a lot of these companies in probably 2006, 7, 8, were not representing Google properly. Mm-hmm. They were saying, hey, we're a Google partner. Uh, sign up with us for $1,000 a month and we're going to get your small business online. And what they wouldn't tell them is like, hey, they're pocketing 40% of <laughs> that $1,000. Mm-hmm. So of the $600 that's left, they're going to spend 400 of that on their own owned and operated properties and put you know, a fraction of it on Google. And the retention wasn't great. Um, The customer satisfaction wasn't great back then with what customers thought was Google. You know, I'm not getting a a good return for my $1,000 because it was so diluted of what actually got set up, uh, put on Google. Um, And, you know, really our philosophy early on was the opposite. Like put as much as you possibly can get on Google before you even venture into something else like even display or, um, or, Yahoo at the time, I think sure. was the second one. Uh, but Google, apparently, everybody's contracts that they had put out to those big companies were expiring. They all had, you know, the first guy probably had a four-year contract, and then they would sign up a few more with a three-year contract and a two-year, but they were all expiring, apparently, in 2009 or 10. And I didn't know this, but um, we also got invited to an event at Google's headquarters. Um, I forgot what they called it. And, you know, we happened to go. It was a good time. And I was with uh, my original partner, that, then the, the sales guy. And we were talking to our rep and we're like, and I said, look, we used to be at, at Yellow Book. We wanted to inquire about how you get the badge to become an actual Google partner. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, hey. And this guy, Kesh, happens to be walking by. Like, just happens to be walking by from this big campus. And th- these guys were interested in the partner program. And, you know, that you could tell this guy is a sophisticated guy. Uh, he had one of those uh, things around his neck. He looked cool. And he said, oh, you really are? What, what's the name of your company? I'm like, oh, Driven Local. You know, you probably didn't, haven't heard of us. He's like, no, I haven't. Well, who are you sending your clients? And um, I rambled off a bunch of our clients because we were so small. I knew probably every single one of them. Mm. And they're, they're both like, oh, you, what, you know all of your clients so well. That's, uh, that's amazing. And he was asking how many accounts we had. I think we said, I think I might have said 200, but we might have had 125. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, you know, long story short, again, he faxed over well they they did some due diligence on our accounts um a little bit of a background check some paperwork but we ended up being one of google's um next set of google premier partners Mm. which was a little bit of a shift apparently this guy ben wood at google who was in the uk for a long time which had a very successful partner program came to the us and he had some requirements and they were, look, if you're going to be a Google premier partner, yeah. you need to allow uh, customers to do a customer satisfaction survey that Google sends. Mm. You need to spend at least 50% of your total accounts spend on Google. Um, and there were a few others. But, you know, later on, Ben told me he walked into some of these big companies that were actually starting to fold themselves because their core product was dying Mm -hmm. and he would walk in and say look if you want to continue reselling our product which to them had lower margins Mm -hmm. than you know call it yellow pages which had tremendous margins they don't really want to sell google and make you know crumbs right so he said they would just kick them out and we were and a few others i think we were one of the first three or four google premier partners um We were used sort of as pawns, and he said we would go back and say, look, we're only going to sign up around 12 of these premier partners. If you want to be one, that's great. You know, work with us, and these are the new rules. Otherwise, we're going to sign these pure digital agencies, uh, like Haystack was one back in the day, us, um, Yodel, and, you know, we were sort of lucky. It was good timing, I Mm -hmm. think, in business. That's uh, sometimes what happens is you get a a good break. Sure. Um, I I imagine there was a lot of other companies way bigger than us, but we just happened to be in the right spot at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we became a Google Premier Partner, uh, along with that came, you know, quality control, of course, uh, keeping our customers happy, but growth. Uh, Google is, you know, pretty focused. Like, here's your goals for the next two years, your growth goals, the number of accounts, the revenue, retention, all of those things. So Google, in essence, became Driven Local's boss in a way. Mm. Um, And there was incentives for us to do it also. So that was our core focus. Um, SEO would come up 
here and there um, back then. And, you know, it wasn't until a few of the sales reps came back and they had some pretty quantifiable and solid results from some advertisers. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't as vague as it is today with, you know, the, the uh, maps ads and um, all other th things coming up. It was basically do a keyword search. And if the guy shows up, the SEO is working. Right. And it was, it was happening with a few of these. So, you know, it had a negative connotation. Like I think a lot of businesses were burnt on SEO mm -hmm. and it's easy because the story is, and it's true. It takes a long time for SEO to work. Definitely. And uh, I think a lot of businesses uh, bought into that and paid a lot of, um, a, a lot of, uh, of people many months in a row on the hope that they're doing work and they were not doing enough work to mm -hmm. make the SEO actually work well. Work well. Um, so our first uh, entry into it was, we called it web presence optimization because I just didn't even want to use the word SEO as an offering. And what year was this? Uh, probably 2011 okay. or 12. Cool. Um, so we called it web presence optimization and it, its main focus was probably more content-based yes. than you know technical aspects of a, of a web page, which... You know, it, which is a weird thing, too. If we built a website, it should have the uh, foundation for SEO already there. Correct. Uh, so that's what we were, we were doing. And, and, you know, it was a, a pretty successful product. I think it was for the advertisers that understood how it works, how long it works. Um, and, you know, it's, not, it's also not a silver bullet either. Like, Correct. It's um, one of those things It's very... Um, the success is dependent upon what your competitor is doing too. If your competitor is doing nothing, you're going to take off. If your sure. competitors are all doing the same things, it's sort of a stalemate and you know, you're just, uh, treading water. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, SEO was a, an interesting, uh, change to me. Like I, I really, really had all my faith in Google ads, partially because of our experience with the 10 company and, and others that would give us the feedback and it's immediate and you can control everything. Mm -hmm. like you can control uh, what shows up, um, how often you show up, the hours you show up, the geography you show up. Right. So to us, it had all of the controls that we're, we were comfortable with. So I think um, that that's what our main focus was. And we became very good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're uh, competing against a lot of other agencies, uh, we won the uh, across the country the highest quality account, highest quality accounts uh, of all of Google advertisers mm -hmm. or agencies. Sure. So um, we we were we were good at Google Ads, and you know I think that's what really helped a lot of the businesses that we were managing mm -hmm. grow themselves, and the retention rate on Google Ads was just phenomenal. So your Google Ads strategy in 2009, 2012, it, how different is that from your Google Ads strategy now? Uh, yeah. So I think in nine, 10, 11, uh, you know, again, the, um, the most sophisticated technology was basically called tracking and being able to tell them you got a certain number of phone calls and you would be able to filter that and say, you know, you got a hundred phone calls, but you know, maybe 70 of them were over a minute and a half. And, you know, of those 50 were answered or something like that, whatever it was. But that was that was the level it went down to, uh, and then I want to say probably in 2013 or so, we started uh, connecting pools of phone numbers to get down to keyword level tracking. Sure. And you know that was also eye opening, uh, you know, because you know what we thought were keywords that were performing because they got a lot of clicks, perhaps, were not turning into leads. Mm -hmm. uh, so. You know that was a that was a big change, um, but it was it was eye opening, and you know we saw an improvement in in our you know base of accounts, which at the time was uh, maybe fifteen hundred, and when you're able to make a change like that and start to you know aggregate that data, it the accounts were just doing better and better. Um, there was a bigger cost on our end, but to us it was worth it. You know the additional lift in in performance and having a leg up on a lot of the competition at the time mm. was was super important. Um, and then the next, you know, level of that is sort of now, and that's not only keyword level tracking, but revenue tracking and pushing that into Google. Mm -hmm. uh, so connecting with CRM systems for small businesses 
and being able to match it's the Google Click ID now mm-hmm. um, to a phone call and then eventually uploading to Google and saying, yeah, this click turned into a lead that turned into $800. Mm-hmm. Or uh, these 10 phone calls turned into leads that turned into zero. And that's where it's going because a lot of the things that we used to do in 2000, you know, early 2000s, uh, were, were pretty manual. And, you know, you would use third party tools to do like our own bidding theories, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, we want to focus in on spot two and every 30 minutes check. If you're, if we're in spot 1.5, uh, decrease our bids a little bit. If we fall down a little bit, increase the bids a little bit. So we had third party tools that would do a lot of these things, but those are all basically gone now. Google's going more of automated bidding and their own artificial intelligence. And what do you think about that? I love it. Okay. Um, I know some are, are, you know, especially in the agency world, I think they have a um, tendency to make Google out to be the bad guy. Like, hey, they're trying to get into your pockets and all of these settings are bad. Sure. But in reality, if you have all of the settings properly set up and you're giving Google the right data, mm-hmm. it works like a top. For sure. And if you don't have all of the settings done properly, and I forgot what the number is, on an account set up, there's over 100 decisions to make. Mm-hmm. And some of them uh, you know, are not for your type of business and don't make sense for you to do, and mm-hmm. they're going to be a waste of, of your budget. But if you're now telling Google's AI and none of these third party tools and a lot of these big agencies have their own proprietary like platforms they don't have the intel that google does correct so when you're able to tell google which of the leads are turning into revenue and how much revenue you're able to do things like target return on ad spend or maximize your uh, your return on ad spend versus just trying to get as many leads as possible because they're the two very different things um you know a good example and it comes up all the time, like, hey, I want to target my competitor's name. And that sounds, you know, juicy. It sounds like, uh, you know, maybe you hate, you know, the, the other uh, plumber down the block or and you want to get back to at him. Yeah. yeah, or they're doing it to you. And those turn into phone calls, but they turn into no revenue. <laughs> and it's because the person did a search for John's Plumbing and they saw a phone number come up and they clicked it. And, um you know, that might have been a 60 second phone call because they may have an IVR on or uh, someone answers the phone and says, you know, can you hold on immediately? These types of things, which which are uh, real life things. And it looks on the report, you got 10 leads from your competitor. But when you actually see how many of those turned into revenue because you are connected to a CRM system, most of them are zero. Right. And, and the, being able to optimize around those things or, or say um, these zip codes are in the past turning into a lot of leads, but they're not turning into sales yeah. either because a competitor is a lower price than you or the demographics are um, different or it's mostly apartments type of thing. Like there's all kinds of things that you would never be able to see on a report, um, but eventually Google's AI is going to be able to see <sighs> all of this information and then basically hone in and run the advertising in areas that are actually converting or add groups that are actually converting into higher revenue than just optimizing towards leads. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that the Google ad has any impact on your SEO performance? Uh, Yeah. Um, Whether it's good or bad, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, Obviously if you're running your own branded keywords, which is always a debate on Google ads, you're probably, what do you think about that first before we go into, uh, I think you protect yourself um, because it's so inexpensive, right? the you know there's two factors in how much you pay for a click and you know one is how much you're bidding and and two quality score and basically quality score is what's the best answer for the consumer for this search so if uh you know the name of your business is mike's garage and jelly beans Mm -hmm. and someone does a search for that a competitor may be trying to bid for that keyword and they may show up there but they're going to pay through the nose because the actual best answer for that is Mike's Garage and Jelly Beans. Interesting. And it's it's so inexpensive, you're going to protect your own brand. Um, and like I said, with search, you can put, you can really uh, refine the messaging. You know, with SEO, 
uh, usually the H1 will show up or uh, Google will change their algorithm and something else will show up. Right. So you really can't control it as much as you can with a paid ad. Sure. Uh, if you have a special offer for the month or, the, or you want to steer people towards a certain page on your website for that month, sure. you can do all of that with paid ads. And, you know, I think the example I give a lot of small businesses is look at the big guys, what they're doing. Um, Home Depot, you know, you do a search for Home Depot. There they have their paid ads for there. Sure. Uh, all of these guys do. And, you know, I think in a lot of cases, 10, 15 cents a click is probably like average. Uh, you know, unless the name of your business is uh, Connecticut Plumbing, you right. know, it's a different story exactly. because you're trying to, uh, you know, get into a, a different thing and make, you know, represent Connecticut Plumbing. And a lot of people are bidding on that. Um, but I think in general for a business, um, bidding on your own name is makes sense. Mm -hmm. You're protecting you, you're protecting yourself. Got it. So back to the SEO affecting the PPC rank. Um, you were talking about brand and please continue. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Um, there's always a temptation and a, a philosophy that some businesses have, like if I'm ranking really high, don't run those PPC keywords. But, you know, it sounds good on paper, but in practice it's very, very hard. Mm. Uh, you know, even something as simple as Google changing their, their, the way their keywords trigger, mm -hmm. you know, what used to be an exact match keyword or even a negative match keyword, uh, don't work the way they used to. They're using uh, variations of that keyword and intent, which works really well, believe it or not. You know, in the past, when I heard Google making a big change like that, uh, I would be very skeptical. And, you know, I think everybody wants to, you know, say, hey, Google's this machine. They want to get more money. Um, but from what I've seen anyway, the, um, the switch has been pretty positive. Mm. So, you know, I guess in, in practice with SEO, ideally, if you had a limited budget and you were only able to run ads for keywords that you don't show up on SEO, that's ideal. Mm. But in practice, it's it's very, very hard to execute. Interesting. So I think what you're you're talking about with like automatic bidding and a lot of the AI that they're doing, um, local service ads falls into one of those yep. different types of things. So yep. I know that you have an extensive amount of experience with local service ads. What are your thoughts on it? Where do you think that's going? Uh, also, another thing that uh, really scared me, and it was interesting, um, we had sold Driven Local in 2015 to one of our sort of frenemy uh, agencies, uh, Scorpion. They're, they're big in uh, a few of the spaces that we were big in. Um, and, you know, that's when the Google, Google local service ads were starting to also beco become big. And I thought it would have a bigger negative impact on paid ads than it actually did. Mm -hmm. And we were very, very, like, I, I want to say three quarters of our uh, profits came from search ads, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in 2015. So I, I was a little nervous. And, you know, I think that was part of the decision to sell to Scorpion. Um, but I think the reality is, and I, uh, Bright Local, I think, did a, a bunch of studies on it. It didn't really have too much of an effect on, on the paid ads right. um, when, when you break it down. It's, as a consumer, I love it. Sure. Um, you know, when you look at it and the idea that Google has vetted these companies and they've submitted their license uh, early on for anybody, any business that a... Uh, company was going to send people into your house. They did background checks on those people too. And to me as a consumer, that was, that was great. That's important, and yeah. I think they would, um, guarantee the job up to, I think it was $1,500 or something like that. That, that was great. Yeah. Um, and for the advertisers, Google had start, rolled this out with a cost per lead, which, you know, I want to say for a plumber, it was $27 in, mm -hmm. in New York city. Uh, and for comparison, a cost of a click you know, is more than that. $35. You know, yeah, yeah, maybe 35 or 45 depending on how aggressive you are. Sure. And if you're good, I don't know, one out of three of those clicks would turn into a lead. For sure. So now instead of paying $75 per lead, Google's saying, hey, you can buy them from us. Right. For, you know, $27 per lead. And, you know, it, they had some parameters around that. A lead was a call that was longer than maybe 30 seconds or 60. I forgot what it was. Or if someone uh, submits a form. But it was feast or famine, you know, the, uh, what determined who shows up for Google local service ads were a lot around proximity, mm -hmm. uh, review scores, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, how quickly you respond to leads. Mm -hmm. So some businesses were set up and they were good when that thing launched. And I think some businesses absolutely crushed it early on where some other businesses started to lose out because maybe they didn't have a lot of reviews or the review score was not 
four point nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and conversely, you know, some businesses that were early on getting a lot of leads from this because they had a four point nine. Mm-hmm. If they drop to four point seven, all of a sudden they're not getting any leads from Google local service ads. So it seemed to be a feast or famine. And mm-hmm. you know, I went early on to some of the Google uh, meetings around Google local. Google local service ads while I was at Scorpion when they were first rolling us out and they were adamant they're not going to change it to an auction and ultimately it turned it to an auction. an auction. Yeah, so what used to be, I think, uh, a absolute layup, no-brainer, you got to do it because if you get any leads from this, you're going to have a very strong return on ad spend mm-hmm. has turned into a, you better monitor that also yeah. and make sure uh, the quality of the leads are there and you're getting the return on ad spend. And, sure. and, you know, I think that's, like I said, I think that's where the industry has changed. Even for small businesses, they have to, over the next couple of years, make sure they're tracking not only calls and leads, but revenue from every source. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of tools out there that allow for that to happen. Make sure you're uploading that to Google. Uh, you can't do it with Google local service ads. you got to track it separately. But uh, you want to make sure you're getting your return on ad spend. Mm-hmm. Now, where do you think uh, local service ads is going to expand into? Because right now, they don't have any medical, um, which for us, obviously, is important. Yeah. Um, where, what do you think that's going to look like in the next 10 years or so? I don't know. Uh, you know, I think part of it is that their partners program has changed too much. We're, we're still a Google Premier partner, but uh, they don't have the communications um, like they used to. And, and to give you an idea, I think there's probably a thousand Google Premier partners now. It's not the same exclusive club. So I, sure. I certainly don't have the inside track on some of those things. I was surprised when they added legal mm-hmm. uh, a little while ago. So, you know, you don't know. Um, I, I'm curious to see where it goes for sure. Yeah, and so let's talk Driven Local. Um, you know, when you were selling it, um, what was kind of going on in your head? You know, because I'm sure you guys were doing really well, right? And so tell me what that part of your life looked like. Yeah, you know, um, really well is, uh, I guess, a relative statement. You know, we never took on any funding. We were um, self-funded all along. So, you know, to me, to running a a business uh, was, you know, just make sure you have more revenue coming in than is going out. So it was never a huge surge of, you know, add 87 salespeople and we're going to blow this thing up. Like we never, we never had that. We were slow and steady growth for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, I think what was going on back then, we were, like I said, we were frenemies with Scorpion. Um, I did get a preview of their platform. I was super impressed with it. Like we were just starting to research uploading revenue to, to Google. Um, and we hadn't completed it. We had the components of it. And we were at a conference in San Diego, Locology, I think it was called. Mm. And, um, you know, a good friend of mine, Jamie Adams, who's at Scorpion now, like I said, d- demoed their platform. And they already had in their platform um, revenue from uh, PPC. Mm. And they, had, they have a beautiful looking platform. Uh, you know, so the reason I'm telling you that is we were running um, a few franchises that were owned by a, a PE firm that might own 12 franchises. We were running two of them. Scorpion was running the other 10. And they were big to us. So uh, when I saw that platform, I was just like, hmm, we don't have a platform like this. <laughs> we had our own platform, but we only had uh, two or three engineers that were building it. So you know, like our salespeople that you know sometimes have uh, enough sales to keep them busy, the engineers were basically busy with keeping up to date with the APIs for the connections to Google, to Facebook, to our listings tool, to um, our display tool. Like that was a full-time job in itself. So we weren't necessarily innovating our platform. We were just keeping it alive. And we had a really, um, I don't want to say sleek platform, but it was a a user-friendly platform that businesses loved because I really distilled all of the information they would want to see. Sure. You can drill down as far as you want to go, but, you know, when you first log on, it would tell you, you know, like, you spent $1,200 last month and you got X amount of leads, unique leads, and where they came from. Um, and, you know, I think it was sort of refreshing to a lot of small businesses that are were used to um, some of the other guys walking in with all of these metrics mm-hmm. uh, that they really did they not care, about. care or see or want yeah. to see. Um, 
So the our platform was pretty cool, but it was basic. And when I saw the Scorpion platform, I said, hmm, it's only a matter of time before these other uh, franchises that we're managing are going to move over to them. Mm. Plus, you know, it, it just it seemed like something that would be a good fit uh, for your customers, our customers, our team to work at this, you know, next level uh, platform. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, we had a couple big accounts mm. and, uh, you know, big accounts are scary for uh, sure. because while they're, they're here, they're good. But when they leave, you know, they really leave a black eye. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times, uh, you know, we I just saw, talked about that. Yeah. You know, the benefits of a $50,000 a month account. Well, there's also a huge con they could leave. Yeah. Because inevitably you're building a team around that account. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think the industry does not really have long-term contracts, so they can kind of leave whenever they want. They don't really show you their cards to you like, hey, you know, we're thinking of leaving in no, six months. It, you, you know, you, you generally get an email saying, hey, uh, we hired XYZ and they're uh, going to take this in-house or they're going to take it to the agency that they worked at, whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, so we had, you know, maybe three accounts that were disproportionately big, uh, which, you know, to me was unsettling. Um, it was getting to a point where I mentioned the Google partnership was uh, an objective from them that needed to always be growing. Like you couldn't have negative revenue, you couldn't have negative accounts. Um, and, I, you know, I just didn't necessarily see the path for the next five years to continue down this path. And, you know, I think that Google partnership was uh, the way we were growing and the way we were doing it. Uh, there was a different way to go about it, but we were using the incentives we got from Google to, you know, sort of how to have our own slow and steady growth. And that, you know, adding salespeople is very expensive to begin with. You know, it mm -hmm. takes a long time to recoup that salary you're giving them of course. and for them to, you know, build up a pipeline. So it was good timing uh, to, you know, sell to Scorpion. I think a lot of our clients uh, benefited from it. Sure. Um, and a lot of our employees, um, you know, thrived moving over to there. I mean, of course, there was some, you know, it's a different culture. Sure. Um, so, you know, not everybody was like 100% happy with it. But for yeah. the most part, there was. And, you know, along the way in... Um, probably 2011 or 12, we, we, I used to outsource some of our PPC to a, a girl in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, she we, must be pretty good. Uh, yeah. She, she got the job done uh, and it was early on. Uh, she, she was good. And, you know, we would give her like a new account to, to build and she would. And then one day she came in and said, well, she didn't come in, but she was remote, which is strange. Everybody's remote today, but she was remote. <laughs> uh, she said, I can't do any work for you anymore because I took a job at this company in Connecticut. And um, I'm like, all right, that's cool. She stayed in touch a lot because we had the Google partnership and we had um, Google reps that were able to help us with, you know, whatever it might be, billing or suspensions or whatever, changes. Sure. And she would always stay in touch. Like, hey, what's this thing that's coming up? And I would, you know, just always uh, stay in touch with her. And, you know, one day she reached out and she said, you know, you should talk to this guy, Jeff, you know, the company I'm at is a Ferocious Media in Connecticut, and he's trying to do what you guys are doing, but you guys seem to be more successful at it. And um, I said, sure, yeah, you know, absolutely, introduce me. So the next morning, it's 6 in the morning, this guy, uh, Jeff Warshaw, he's in the office, and he enters, enters in. He's a little bit like Kramer with his entrances. He's, like, all over the place, and he's a character. And we got along really well. I told him, um, you know, a little bit about my experience with the Yellow Pages, and, you know, our, our sole focus is making sure we have the highest retention, uh, which is strange because the Yellow Pages, it was always a, all about the new business. Almost mm. like, hey, you, you're sure. always signed up with us. We don't care about yeah. you. And to me, that made no sense. Yeah. So, you know, driven local retention was crucial to us. Uh, you know, that was more important than signing up new accounts. Um, so... I said, yeah, yeah, you know, we we should talk. And you know, the week a week later, I went to his office in Westport, Connecticut. And ironically, the name of his agency was Ferocious Media. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a few years back owned a whole bunch of radio stations and had exited with a, a pretty big payout. Sure, but he had a core staff, and he decided to start a local agency. In his head, it was like, hey, if you're a dentist and someone's reading the New York Times in, in Westport, they should see an ad for that dentist. Right. And, you know, he hired a very expensive guy from uh, Publicis, which is a big, you know, um, Madison Avenue agency. And 
you know, I went in to see that guy and, you know, I was asking questions like, how do you like add a keyword? And, you know, the process he had going through some, I, I think it was Adobe back then, he built the system for local businesses that were the same you would set up for a Fortune 100 company. Mm -hmm. Like it was o way overkill. Sure. And it was sort of the same uh, media mix, like as little possible as Google as you can. And, you know, display, which at the time, the targeting was not there yet to really do local display, much less prove its effectiveness. Right. Uh, so we started fulfilling for them. He had a small sales force and, you know, same thing, that renewal rate went to where ours was, which was always above 90%. A few years later, uh, it was all going fine. And, you know, I think the radio stations uh, at the time were heavily, he had none, were hev heavily leveraged and starting to run into a financial challenges. And a lot of them were on sale for cheap. And I think he's known in the industry. So... He was approached to buy some radio stations for what were way less than they were selling a few years back, and he did. He bought some stations, um, Long Island, Connecticut, um, Maryland, I want to say, in Montana. Uh, and, you know, the digital agency didn't necessarily fit into, you know, their, their daily um, focus. Sure. It was a small part of it. Yeah. And, you know, he said, well, hey, why don't we just, you know, fold all of this into Driven Local, which we did. Uh, he ended up being a partner in Driven Local. We took Ferocious Media uh, and changed it to Driven Local. And the um, reason I mentioned that, after a few years at Scorpion, uh, Scorpion's at, they, they focus on a few verticals. How, um, how long were you there? Scorpion? Yeah. Three years. Three years, okay. Um, they focus in on uh, legal, healthcare, franchise, and home services. Mm -hmm. um, so we had sold them a mixed bag of accounts. Uh, you know, guys that do balloon animals or party rentals tent and rentals. tent rentals. Um, you know, really, back then we would we would take on anything. You know, like someone has said, that changed? Yeah, uh, which I, I, you know I'll, I'll go into. I think you learn your lessons, uh, but it was all around you know chasing the the Google um, performance plan. Sure. You know, and if we needed, you know, 25 accounts net growth this quarter and, you know, someone's walking in with a guy that builds dog houses, like, hey, throw <laughs> them in. Them ads. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll figure out how to make that thing run. And, you know, most of the time we did. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Scorpion always had this mixed bag of accounts and, sure. and people running those accounts that were from Driven Local that we used to call Driven Local Legacy. We tried, you know, it sort of had a negative connotation. You know, you're in the corner working on those old accounts. Uh, we tried different names for it or whatever, but it, it just didn't, they didn't fit into the Scorpion verticals. Mm -hmm. um, or there were some accounts that might have been a plumber that didn't necessarily have uh, the funds or resources to pay, uh, you know, Scorpion services are a premium. So they just stayed in the Scorpion mixed bag. And, you know, I was always talking to, to Jeff. And, you know, eventually we said, hey, why don't we buy those back from Scorpion and, uh, become ferocious media uh you know i didn't think scorpion really wanted us to use driven local as the name sure so we brushed off the uh books from ferocious media took the accounts and, and maybe 30 people from scorpion that had never moved on to scorpion platforms they were still using driven local systems and so now um we're ferocious media and you know we kind of have two two hats to wear every day we, we fulfill for the radio station so if they're out selling the radio and they're also website. selling a website and ppc or social or seo or uh, any of the things that we do um, we package those up in a special way for for radio um, that makes sense for them but on the same token we're also building our own direct sales um, and um, that is the answer to will we take on a doghouse builder um, we we really really try not to and it would have to be some you know massive doghouse builder mm -hmm. uh with ambitions to to take that on our our main focus is home services sure uh, mostly plumbing and hvac and maybe electrical contractors we have a you know huge amount of experience in in running those campaigns in working with those types of um business owners which are different than a chiropractor sure. um, or a dentist and then we have um, a lot of insights into the CRM systems um, or uh, like Service Titan is a big one that they use sure. and they're all connected to it and that's a great platform for them to use it does their quotes it does their 
uh, dispatching. Stat, the dispatching, like it's able to tell you of the customer service reps, like this guy's closing, you know, 20%. What's going on with, you know, the calls he's, he's taking in. So it has all of the pieces for us to have a, a really solid partnership with a plumbing or HVAC company that's looking to grow. Right. And, you know, that's really what we're, we're looking for now. We're not chasing a, a uh, a performance from from Google anymore. I, I think we're looking for more of those right type of um, partner um, clients. And you know, right now, we haven't had a sales person uh, since we spun off from Scorpion. We just hired one in home services because he's the right guy. Mm. But we've been getting um, you know a solid one or two referrals a month, mm-hmm. uh, with our goal of really just signing on one a month because it's a pretty extensive onboarding process to mm-hmm. make sure all of the connections between their chat. Um, their SEO, uh, their PPC, uh, the, uh, booking, uh, scheduling engine, mm-hmm. like making sure we're able to connect to all of those things and we're able to have the proper attribution to push into Google um, revenue matchback. And then, you know, that's where things start to really accelerate and turn positive from the, uh, usually we're taking an account over from, from another company that doesn't do that. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned platform at Ferocious or uh, at Driven Local. So mm-hmm. I know at Scorpion, at a lot of different places like TNT Dental, um, different places that have their own content management systems and their own technology. When yeah. I search your name, I see an agency analytics um, testimonial you gave about their platform, which is great. They do a good job for like analytics. Yep. Um, I'm curious to understand if you are building platform, why, if you're not, why you know what's what's yeah because it seems like you're not right you're using you're using wordpress you're not really investing in platform and I'm curious well i i don't think I, I think building a um full content management system for building websites i mean you'd have to be a massive company to to make those economics work sure uh you know i think especially today engineers mm-hmm. are at a at a premium. premium they're they're absolutely not cheap um, and you know, I think that is one of the lessons that I learned at, at Driven Local. Um, like I said, we had built a reporting platform, um, and there wasn't a lot available off the shelf when, right. we, when we built when that. Built at least it. not to have some of the certain capabilities that we wanted to have. Uh, and then we built our own CRM also. To it was not necessarily CRM; it was more a project management tool that would allow a PPC manager to log in in the morning and say, okay, here's the accounts I need to work on, or this one is, uh, there's a flag up on it because the cost per lead went up a lot over the last whatever days. So it was custom for us. But, you know, one of uh, the the leaders that I've always watched and uh, is very successful is a guy named Joe Walsh, who he was not the founder of Yellow Book, but he was the CEO I want to say from from the 80s for a long time, and it took the company from something like $20 million to over a billion dollars. Um, and, you know, he's very much a local guy, but he's now the CEO of Thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, Huge. Yeah, and, and um, you know, one of the things that they do is they don't build their Anything. own tools. They pipe them all into a tool that is, you know, easy for a small business owner to use. They use Duda. Oh, do they? Yep. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yep. Um, but... You know, to there's companies that specialize in almost everything that we do, and I have no reason to really reinvent the wheel. Sure. But to utilize those tools and always be nimble enough to say, okay, well, this company's tool was great for two years, but this other one is doing the same thing plus more in a better way. So let's just switch all of the accounts over to that. Mm. So it gives you that flexibility. And, uh, you know, having a team of three engineers that are working on one little small piece of something that you're doing, it's always behind, like it's never up to date. And I think that all came out over the last five years. You know, a lot of the tools that were third party tools for managing PPC as an example, sure, they're almost all gone. And it's partially because you can say Google stole their ideas, but they had these ideas and eventually Google folded them in. And even, um, Responsive text ads, like right? Th- that was on other tools, right? Uh, earlier on, but now it's right within Google, uh, as it, it should be, right? I mean, yeah. So, uh, you know, I I always have and and still do believe, like, don't fight Google mm-hmm. and their tools. Work with, learn them. how to use them, mm-hmm. and, and Google's never going to expose, and you're never going to be able to match the information that Google has about people's 
past histories of, of what they've searched, their, dem their real demographics, like what Google surfaces that you can target and, you know, and all you can really do is increase and decrease bids based on, you know, the percentage of someone's uh, household income relative to the people that they're in. It's just not the same as allowing Google's machine learning to actually take and ingest all of this information and really maximize your advertising budget and getting a return on, on ad spend. Like, mm -hmm. uh, to me, don't fight it. Yeah, try to learn it, get better at it. Yep. Responsive text ads are amazing. I think they're so cool. Um, and so when you were doing that sell-off and that transition, um, you mentioned your employees went to Scorpion and then you took some back that were working on some of those key accounts. Um, what was that transition like? I mean, did they have to redo all the sites? Um, you know, no, what well, would the employees think? You know, something like that. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we necessarily knew uh, enough about Scorpion at the time of the acquisition. Like, I thought the cultures were uh, almost a, a perfect match, but I, I think Scorpion was, and I didn't know it at the time, a way, way bigger company hmm. um, and way more refined or uh, way more ahead than I thought. Like, I think people in our company, which we were about 100 people at the time, and within that 100 people, there might have been five or six departments. So everybody really had a say in in um, processes and direction. This is at Driven Local? Uh, yeah. 100 people? Yeah. Wow. And, you know, Scorpion was 800 or 700 uh, in, in 2017 when we sold to them. So, and, and they had their own platform. So, like, someone that was used at, at Driven Local to be to using the Google interface or the Microsoft interface directly, that was cut out of the picture. Like, right. all of your Google certification and everything that you knew is sort of moot. Like, sure. move over to the Scorpion platform, and they have their own thing where you press the buttons and make decisions and, and things like that. Um, so, it was... Um, I don't know. I, I think for any company that sells, it's always always some surprises. And, sure. you, you know, I think they were way more buttoned up and less for some of the people that we had on our driven local staff. They were used to having that input and trying to figure out the best ways to get better results for clients or even, um, you know, how to make sure the employees around us are uh, happy. And to me, that's the, the two main things, making sure your customers are happy and your employees are happy. You know, I think Scorpion had a lot of that figured out. So some people were sort of bored and mm. didn't necessarily um, switch over to Scorpion. So like I said, there was this group. They weren't necessarily VIP accounts or anything like that. They were just accounts that didn't move over to the Scorpion platforms. Right. And, the, you know, I think this group of people were always just, they were separate. Like, you know, Scorpion has a lot of, like, events and contests and, you know, exciting stuff, which... They just, not because it was intentional, they just never participated in it because they were just part of a separate thing. They were this uh, older legacy uh, account. So um, switching them, moving them over, yeah, I mean, there was a, a little bit, it was March 2020 when we went right into COVID. So mm -hmm. as much as we had a lot of work to do, it was, a lot of it was, I, 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 want, I want to use the word survival mode, but Strangely, it wasn't because a lot of the businesses that we, we work with actually got busier. We did, of, of course, have some accounts pause because uh, sure. I think everybody During was uh, afraid of what was going to happen. And, mm. you know, uh, it's totally understandable. But we, we did we did OK. We did well those those times. But we didn't you know, we, too, were unsure and didn't necessarily put the pedal to the metal as far as hiring and, and changing things out like we had a. We had to ditch uh, the reporting platform that we had built and switch all of those over to um, right now it's agency analytics, which um, you know we tested a whole bunch of different reporting platforms. That one seems to be the best one for us and our sure. clients. Um, where we want to switch our CRM system, which was you know built in 2010. Uh, we're switching that over to a project management tool called ClickUp, which is very, very customizable and it's, it's a project management tool, sure. which I think uh, will give you know, especially with the work from home, like we switched to all work from home, which I was never a fan of, mm. but I think we've made it work. Mm -hmm. I think we've been able to tap into a ta talent pool that's across the country now, mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, within a, whatever, 20 mile radius on Long Island. Um, so that's been a positive part of it. But I think something like ClickUp will give my managers the ability to see, you know, what work's been done on accounts in a, in a better way. 
Um, and it will also, in a, in a better fashion, allow some of the employees that are actually working on accounts a list of things to do rather than right now we use uh, Trello. There's, uh, of course, sheets on, on doing things. Sure. So we want to make sure um, our, cl- our, our employees are comfortable with like, hey, this is what I should be doing and not have this like nebulous thing like, oh, I don't know if I'm missing something. Right. And I think um, I'm, I'm very sure ClickUp is going to be that solution, but it's, um, it's a big project. Yeah, I just read a LinkedIn article about them this morning. So we use oh, their yeah. alternative Basecamp. Very yes. familiar. Very yes. familiar. 37 Signals of the company that made Basecamp. I read his book yeah, about working from home. Yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah it's brilliant. But Jace, Jason's the owner of it, yep. um, and they, they do some really cool stuff. So, um, you know, the sell-off was, was – I didn't know it was that recent. I had no idea. So you, you were doing digital agency during 2008, 2009. So you yeah. just kind of saw the recession happen yeah. and how customers responded to it. Yep. What's the difference in the way they responded in 2020 versus like 2008 when they're doing advertising? Um, well, I think there's, there's a few things there. In 2008 and nine, I think it was all about taking Yellow Pages market share. Mm. And the economy was turning sour. I think one of the things that's pretty constant with small business owners is when they are doing well, they don't want to change anything. And it was Yellow Pages for a long time, but when the economy started to change, and they were looking for areas to, to cut spend. A lot of them were like, okay, well, let me cut this $1,500 a month yellow pages and try, I don't know, $1,000 a month in in Google ad spend or, or search engine marketing. And like I said, back then, the competition wasn't nearly what it was. So they were getting phenomenal returns and they were saving some money. And that made them consider the change from yellow pages to uh, PPC was the economy. And, you know, I think you have two things. You have uh, COVID from 2020, uh, which was a little bit of a wacky world as far as the economy. I mean, obviously the, the market and people's savings were at all times high. I think a lot of businesses that are in our uh, sweet spot of home services were busier than ever. They were thriving. Because people were, you know, destroying their dishwasher. They were home all day. <laughs> they were doing improvements to their backyard. They were they were just home. Like, obviously... A, uh, a plumber is going to end up with more work. So um, it was obviously a, a positive then. But I think what's really starting to um, come down the pike is a, is a real recession. Mm. Um, and whether it's real or um, perceived that it's coming, I think business owners are starting to brace for it and be ready for it. And fortunately, we're not a super premium. Sure. And, and I think I know who our competitors are and our, um, our pricing – I'm, I'm guessing, but we're, we're probably about half of what some of the bigger agencies that do the same thing charge. Mm. Um, you know, obviously we don't have the the name brand that some of these ones do, and you know, I respect they as they get busier and they have a bigger name recognition and a bigger sales force. They also raise their prices too. Mm. Um, but you know, it's been a long time since we have lost a pitch. Uh, based on price to mm. a competitor. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's the opportunity is if you can come in and save a business money by still providing a, a service and you do it well, they're going to switch who they're using. Um, mm. You know, maybe that overall for digital marketing, it's a it's a net uh, setback um, because, it, you know, the gravy train is sort of dried up for a while. Sure. But I still think there's a huge opportunity for smaller agencies that are nimble and don't have, you know, that's another thing. We don't have... Um, as much expenses, you know, when we sold Driven Local, I think our rent in one office was like $27,000 a month. And we had two other ones that were smaller. Uh, but with the work from home, that's another positive thing is you don't have those hard costs anymore. Um, so it's an interesting time for sure. And I'm, I'm curious to see where the next few years bring. Yeah, I think, I think you're right about that. Um, especially during COVID, all of our clients were extremely busy. Um, so it was very nice to see. We didn't have, we had one client pause out of like 50 at the time. Now we're up in the late hundreds, which is good. So, um, hundred employees, that's pretty massive. Um, it's all relative, I guess. It is relative. Definitely. Yep. If you're talking to Amazon, that's nothing. Right. <laughs> if you're talking to me, that's almost 10 X. So what was revenue like at that time? I mean, what were you doing on a monthly recurring revenue basis when you did sell? Uh, we were doing about 25 million a year 
Um, but there was some accounts that had some pass through revenue to Google and to, to Facebook. So they would give us just one lump sum where others would pay Google or Facebook directly and give us a management fee. What so do you do now? I'm so curious. We almost completely switched to um, management. So they pay the media directly. Okay. To, to Google and to you, Facebook. Your management fees separate. Yeah, and I, and I think the industry has changed. I think a lot of uh, clients have been burnt by some other agencies that maybe uh, don't give them their account uh, after it's been running for two or three years. Um, so, you know, we're totally fine with, you know, managing the account that they pay Google. Uh, there's still some sort of institutions that they just don't have the ability, you know, if, if it's a government or if it's like a big... Uh, hospital or something, they can't put a credit card into Google. Sure. Uh, you know, so they give us one lump sum and then, you know, we you pay, pay Google, Google with that and we take our management fee out of it. Uh, but I do think that's the way the industry is going, mm. uh, which I- I'm totally fine with. There's uh, less concern about receivables there. Sure. Um, and, and, and bad debt. You know, we never had a lot of it, but, you know, some, some of these are big budgets. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it totally works for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so at $25 million a year in revenue, which is extremely, extremely impressive, once again, relative to me, um, what are some of the differences that you saw when you started getting to those types of numbers uh, compared to your 1 to 10 million mark? Because right now we're at, we're at about 1.2 to 1 point, I think we're going to do 1.6 million this year, which is exciting. It is. But I know the challenges of being 10 million plus is way different than 1 million to 10 million. So what do you think some of those big differences were for you? You know, it's 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 hard to say. There's, there's a lot of things there, and um, you know, as an example, one of my one of my partners from Driven Local, he didn't go to Scorpion, um, and you know, part of it, he said he's an outside cat. He didn't really want to work for anybody. Got it. You know, so <laughs> understood. Own, but you know, now he's basically doing the same thing, and I, I don't know what he's doing in revenue, but he's he's probably making more by himself and not having a big staff and not having a goal of growing and sure. you know his goal is not nec- necessarily an exit it's he's building up a, a revenue stream for himself um, he outsources almost all of it and you know he's doing quite well for himself uh, you know definitely sub a million dollars in revenue um, versus having a 25 million dollar company with 100 employees and staff and the goal of growth mm-hmm. um, I, I, I do think there was a point where it was a little easier to sign on accounts because uh, we had experience. We had a, a lot of credentials. Um, we were partners with uh, like Next Our Network is a big plumbing and HVAC consulting um, company that works with the the biggest plumbing and HVAC. So we were one of their preferred partners. You know, so that helped us. And then I think, um, like I mentioned, with, with Scorpion, you know, they manage some big name like personal injury attorneys. And when they talk to another one, they're like, hey, there's, uh, you know, John's law firm. Don't sure. you want to be as successful like him? We manage it. And, you know, to a degree, we ended up with the same thing. Like, hey, these are the ones that we're managing. And, you know, if it was between us and a guy with no experience, they're going to choose us. Mm-hmm. So in one way, it became easier. Um, and I guess from another way, it was harder. And, and you know, that's just having a, a bigger breadth of accounts to make sure are getting the best results and technology. So when there was a change, mm. you know, doing it uh, across 100 accounts versus, you know, 1,000 plus accounts be- became a little bit more complex. Mm. Um, but I, I think overall, you know, scale is something to consider. Sure. Um, and, you know, that's why we're trying to focus a lot in on home services right now. Mm-hmm. Taking our expertise and all of our knowledge of home services, we can launch an account that doesn't have that learning period that you would on an account that you never worked on before because you have to learn about it and you have to find all of those, like, even negative keywords and nuances of what work and what don't. Definitely. Um, it, it really throws our machine of the back end into a little bit of a... Um, a challenge when someone brings in, a, you know, a clock maker, you know, mm-hmm. which never we never ran before. Definitely, uh, you know, yeah. I understand <laughs> the guy's got money. We're good at what we do, sure. but we've never actually done it for best. this type of, of client. Yeah, um, and we could probably make it work over a long period of time, um, but it's definitely not as efficient as bringing on like, a, hey, another plumber. These are the services within plumbing he wants to do and focus in on. Um, 
that we know we have the experience, we have the accounts built out, we have templates built out, we have a playbook for that. We know the questions to ask him ahead of time. Mm. And it's, to me, that's scale. Sure. So we're coming up on time. Ah. Um, yeah, happens pretty fast, right? Uh, what are your overall plans for Ferocious Media? And then after you answer that, I'd love to know what advice you would give an agency owner who is maybe doing 300000 to a million dollars a year. How can they take it to the next level? Sure. Um, I think the plans are for us to grow. Uh, I, I've been looking the last couple of years at some smaller agencies that are you know, for sale. Um, I think in that period of time, the multiples that they were asking were sort of ridiculous um, and none of them necessarily made sense. Um, I know Jeff, who uh, runs Connoisseur Media, has been looking to possibly add a lot more radio stations, in which case hopefully we're doing a lot more fulfillment for them. Um, so w part of it, we're going to grow slow and steady with our home services focus. Um, and then if something comes along and it's an agency that's a good fit for us culturally uh, with a, what they're focused in on, like if they're in a vertical and putting the two together would give some sort of efficiencies or advantages, uh, that would make sense. Um, and for an agency doing, uh, I think any agency, my my advice now, which is different than in the past, is to focus in on either a special product or offering. Uh, there, there's an agency, for example, that I forgot they're in, um, I think, Utah, but they focus in on just like Yelp is their the thing that they focus in on and became experts at and they're really, really good at it. And I've seen them grow in like a year and a half, just tremendously on Yelp, not to one particular type of vertical, but they know how to make Yelp work for small businesses. And Yelp does work by the way, for a lot of businesses, if you do it right. Yeah. We're, we're partners with them. The, um, one of the gentlemen actually knows you and I, I let him know that we're going to be <laughs> hopping on a podcast. So yeah, the, um, the, it, surprisingly, you know, I think, um, Yelp's interesting. It's not for some reason. It's not as exciting to a lot of businesses but it as, works. as Google, uh, but it's a machine. Like people don't go to Yelp for research. Correct. Um, when they're going into Yelp and they went down the list to say, you know, I need a plumber. They're they they have high intent. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you do a search for, you know, veterinarians near me. The first Yelp's two organic there. results are Yelp. are Yelp, and a huge amount of people click on that and then click on the ad within Yelp. So that's a side story. Hmm. Um, so either become really good at something, um, and it could be Google Ads, it could be you know, building landing pages, uh, or really dig into a vertical, which I know a lot of people are doing. But like, really, it's hard to say no to business. But I think long term. The benefits of just like focusing in on uh, um, pediatric dentists, as an example, like maybe not all dentists, but pediatric, pediatric dentists, like become the expert at that. It's a slow start, but once that uh, rock starts rolling, it just picks up steam, and you know all of a sudden they'll be knocking on your door. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. That was My pleasure. very insightful. Um, wish you had more time, but I appreciate you coming down. My and, pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you.